Morning, Ranger Todd here at Camp Alamisco. Happy Sabbath to you again. I'm glad you could be with us and join us here on Sabbath. It's peaceful out on the lake today. Um, it's been quiet here at camp. I think that's an understatement. I uh, hope that you and, and yours are well where you are at. Uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Jesus, I pray that you will be with us. Bless us on your Sabbath day. I pray that above all things at this moment that we can see your face. And we thank you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you for being our friend. We pray in your name. Amen. Over the last five years, I've taken a unique sort of um, journey in my own spiritual walk. And it's um, what I'd like to share with you a little bit today. As you know, I'm a storyteller by nature. And um, today I'd like to talk about Jesus. Over the last five years of my life, I decided to go on a journey where I would, uh, at exclusion of all else, just follow Jesus around. Um, I read about him over and over and over again. I read about what he did, where he, where he went when he was here, when he was God amongst us, and uh, have found it to be the most uh, life-changing thing that I've ever participated in, to just go and, and sit and be with Jesus. So today, <clears throat> what I'd like to reflect on for a few minutes, and this is hard because there's just so much. You know, from the moment that we even knew that Jesus was going to be born, from the moment that the angel came and spoke to Mary, to the last words that Jesus said as he was ascending up to his Father, that, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's just there's so much packed in there. You know, the Apostle John was so correct when he said that if we were to write down everything that Jesus did and said that all the books in the world could not contain it. One of the stories um, in the Bible that Jesus told was a story of um, sort of a son gone bad. And it's a story that we all know. It's a story that if you are a Christian, if you have been on a journey with Jesus, there's some time in your life when you have found immense comfort in this story. When the way Jesus portrayed God as acting towards us has brought you great comfort. Now one of the interesting observations I'd like to make starting this is that it says in the book, The Desire of Ages, that if Jesus had not come when he did, that all knowledge of God would have been lost. All knowledge of God would have been lost. And, you know, when we think of all knowledge of God being lost, we think of somebody gathering all the Bibles together and burning them, and then this period of time passing to where you would pass people on the street and you'd say, God, they'd say, well, who's that? You know, that's what we think of when we think of as all knowledge of God being lost. And yet in this book, Desire of Ages, it says that if Jesus had not come when he did, that all knowledge of God would have been lost. And yet we're looking at, at people who held in reverence to the scriptures. Every boy, by the time he was 12 years of age, had memorized the first five books of the Bible. They were, there were vast uh, numbers of people who spent their entire lives studying the intricacies of the written word or, or rewriting the Bible, just dot and across of a T at a time. They had the Ten Commandments. They practiced health reform. They were looking to the soon coming of Christ or of the Redeemer. In the, there was a nation 
whose history and purpose was to represent and further Jehovah God himself. And so how could it be that if Jesus had not come when he did, that all knowledge of God would be lost in this journey of the last five years? I've come to the realization that that journey or that, that knowledge is who God is. When you look at the time that Jesus came down and was Emmanuel, the God that was with them, and you, you see what he did. He, he went from place to place and he comforted us. He wept with us. He healed our sick. He comforted us. He raised our dead to life. He made our blind to see. He spoke peace. He spoke to nature and it stood still. It's amazing when you think of all the things that Jesus could have done when he was here on earth. When you think of the arguments that we as Christians beat each other up over, things that we argue about continually, that Jesus could have solved those arguments just like that. And he did not. But he was not silent. And he was not inactive. It says again in the same book, Desire of Ages, that, that Jesus' greatest tactical problem here on earth was finding time for sleep and finding time to eat. Jesus was busy. And so you have to come to the conclusion when you, when you see the world as it was, and then you see God Himself coming down in the form of man and dwelling amongst us, and what he chose to say, and what he chose to do. It speaks volumes about the character of God. And of course, we as Seventh-day Adventists are so based in the idea that we are here because of a great controversy between Christ and Satan. The Satan in heaven made accusations against God, and God being a loving God, a patient God, who will only receive a, um, a worship of love, who does not operate by force, that the most important thing that God could do would be to share with us not these technicalities, not these details, but who He was, what His personality was like, how He acts, how He feels, and how He conducts Himself towards us. And so Jesus he did all these wonderful things, and we could just talk the rest of the day about it, but one of the things that Jesus did was he told us stories. And again, when you think about it, why did Jesus tell the stories, and what did they mean? I believe, and I've heard other theologians um, express that they believe that when Jesus told us stories, that they were at multiple levels. Not only was he talking to us about each other or about direct issues between us as God, but that Jesus, when he told a story, was always saying to us, this is who I am. This is who God is. And so we come down to this story about this sun gone wrong. And we all know it so well because at one time or another in your life, I'm sure you have looked into the eyes of the prodigal son and you've seen yourself. And as the story unfolds, you feel his depression. Let's just go there for a minute. So we got the prodigal son and here he is, he's a little guy. And he's growing up in his father's home. And from everything that you gather through the sum of the story, you see a boy who's raised in an incredibly caring world an incredibly safe world. You see a father that, from everything we can tell, was quite successful. He seems to have abundant means and vast servants at his disposal. And he runs a, a very, what we might call a successful business. And he's a caring father, and his sons and his family are close to him. But it so easily happens in our minds, something went desperately wrong. 
and the son begins to see his father as arbitrary, as severe, as unkind, all things that Satan loves to traffic in. And he begins to misinterpret his father, and he begins to believe that somewhere out over there is the real world. That's real life out there, and I'm missing it. And so one day he comes to his father, and he says, and I'm going to say it in sort of a modern vernacular, he comes to his father and he says, you know what, Dad? You're holding me back. I got a best life to live. There's a whole world out there to be seen. And I think that you need to go ahead and die already. And I think that I need to, uh, I think I need to go ahead and get my inheritance. Because I don't know that I'm really interested in sitting around here waiting around this uh, pad until you, until you pass. So, um, why don't you go ahead and cough it up now. Let me tell you something, I have sons. I have children. There's nothing I love in the world more desperately than my children. And I cannot imagine the knife that would have gone through that father's heart to in the verbiage of the day to have your son come to you and say, you're already dead to me and I want my inheritance now. But again, Jesus is talking about his father and, and this father, he will not take anything except the homage of love. He will not accept anything except the obedience that is, is willfully given. He's not vindictive and he's not vengeful and he doesn't knock down those who disagree with him. And so God in his gracious mercy portrays this father as coming to Jesus or coming to his son and saying, okay, son, I'll do it. I'll do it. And so you can picture they have a monster yard sale or something. I don't know. I don't know how they came up with this boy's portion of the wealth. But as the story goes on, this portion of the wealth was not small. This boy went into a far country and he stayed there a good long while. And as money will do, it attracts people. And it, 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 it did for him. And uh, he lived a great life. He lived the life that money can buy. And he went to places that a lack of discretion will take you. And he does that until he is a very broken young man. And he discovers those things that you discover outside of the care of, a, of, your, of your father or outside of the care and the admonitions of a benevolent God. But the world is a hard and cruel place. And those who say that they're your friends at the party tomorrow morning are nowhere to be found. And about time this boy is spent and broke and hung over and broken down. All the people who gathered around him are gone. And here he stands, portrayed as though by Jesus that even his clothing is in tatters. And so Jesus talking to a, to a Jewish audience, he really is sensational at this point and he really draws the story to a climax because he portrays this young man going out and looking for help, looking for work, and he can find nobody who cares. And he finally goes in his, in his rags and he finds a local farmer who agrees to employ him. But he sends him out to feed the swine. I don't even know in our modern culture how to find an equivalency for that. It would have in the day been horrifying at best. And I'm sure that when Jesus said these words, that he got gaunt stares around the audience and audible gasps. And this young man finds himself in this place that is as dark as leprosy. And here he is, and he's feeding the pigs and he finally comes to his senses. And he thinks back about his father who now doesn't seem quite as severe, who doesn't seem quite as uncaring. And he starts to really reflect on his dad and he starts to remember so many good things 
that somehow weren't there before. And he starts to realize how good his father was and how desperately he misses him. But he also has to remember back and things start flashing through his mind like, I think you're as good as dead to me. Why don't you go ahead and die already? I don't feel like sitting around this pad waiting for you to pass on. Old man, why don't you cough up my part of the inheritance now? And he starts thinking of the ruthless way that he said all this stuff. And in his wildest imagination, in the selfishness of the heart that he has, he cannot imagine that his father would have any time for him now. We all know this story so well. What the boy fails to realize is, is that since the day he walked out of his house, that his father has never been the same since. The family knows it. The servants know it. People in town know it. He loses weight. He never smiles. He doesn't approach his work in the same way that he used to. It's like there's been a tragic death in the family. And anybody who comes past that home, anybody who lives in that home knows that every night, every day, at the end of the day, as the sun is going down, that the father is on the front porch. He's got a rocking chair out there, and he sits in it, and he rocks back and forth, thousand-yard stare into nowhere. He's got a path worn in the paint on the porch. We all know the story. One day, as it's getting dusk, and the father is sitting there, and he looks down the road, he sees at a distance that only a father could recognize, a form. It's a form that he knows is his boy. And in complete abandon of any self-respect, and in tremendous abandon of the etiquette of the day, and who he is and what that means, the father gets up and he begins to cry and he begins to walk and the walk becomes a run and it isn't long and this man who is normally dignified and respected is running pell-mell down the road and in the distance you can hear as he goes away from you, my son, my son. And the boy is hit hard and the father, as he approaches him, sees that he is thin and he is gaunt and he clings to his boy and they embrace. And the father cries and the son cries. And he is in rags and the father, he, he, he pulls himself away from the boy and he sees this and he smells the swine. And he will not have it. And he takes his own robes, which are nice, from around his shoulder, this large cloak that is the symbol of who he is, and he wraps it tightly around his boy so that anybody who might pass, anybody who might look on, cannot see the shame of his son, so that when they look, all they will see is he and his boy and his robe. And the son pulls away, and he's got this little phrase thing, you know, that he's, he's got all rehearsed. You know, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you, and I'm no longer blah, blah, blah. He doesn't even get the story out. And the father is not hearing anything of it. And he stammers between tears, and he takes the ring off of his finger, which in the day was his Visa Platinum card. And he slides it onto his boy's hand. And it says that he, he pulled him tight to his side and he ushered him home. And he calls out with a joy and with a youthfulness that nobody has heard in months or years. My son is alive. My son is well. Kill the fatted calf. Plan a party. Invite the neighbors. My son is alive. And there's this, this, this great rejoicing that commences but as Jesus tells the story, he's not done here. Because there is an older brother, and the older brother is coming in from the field. And the party is going on, and the father is with the son, and everybody in the household rejoices. There has not been joy in this house in a great long while. 
and the son comes up and he wants to know what's going on. He won't even go in and ask. He wants to do a little recon and plan an argument. And he's told that the brother has come home and he's peeved. And he refuses to go in. He has been stolidly working this pad. He has been hoeing in the field. He's been doing it right. And to think that this, this lecherous brother of his is going to come in and get anything but a spit in, a se in, in the face and a hoe to hoe the field. To think that he would be allowed to be anything but a servant is revolting and insulting to him. But the point I'd like to make today is what happens when the father comes out. So the father comes out to meet his son, and the son, he's, he's peeved. And as you know, I've worked all these years. I've been out here hoeing the fields. I didn't go off and do riotous things. You never even so much as gave me a kid goat with my friends. And now you're going to let this swine come back here, and you're going to celebrate. And the father is shocked, and he's hurt. And he says, oh, you don't understand. My son was dead. My son was dead, and now he's alive. And the father looks into his other son's face, into the older boy's face, and he can't understand. Because he said, son, I always have you with me. And in the story that Jesus tells, there's this tragic truth that comes to the surface. The younger boy saw his father through very selfish eyes and what he could get for him, from him. The same eyes that the older brother saw his father through. And the pain of the father wells up in the middle of this story because what mattered to the father were his sons. What mattered to the father was being a family and being together. What mattered to the father was the love that they shared for each other. It didn't have anything to do with the farm. It didn't have anything to do with hoeing the fields. The father knew that there was darkness where his other son went. But he knew that there together they were a family and they were safe. And you hear the voice of God crying out through this story that Jesus told. That it's about relationships. It's about us. It's about being together. It's not a heaven to win. It's not a hell to shun. You know, when Jesus was here, his disciples, the entire time he was here, bickered about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. That's why Jesus had to wash their feet in the upper room, only hours before he was crucified until he died on a cross. Mary, his own mother, was looking for him to become the king. Everybody misunderstood. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow after him. They behold the Savior's matchless love, revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth, from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross. And the sight of him subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholder. They hear his voice and they follow him. At the Last Supper, Jesus has to wash the disciples' feet. Only hours from now, Peter will stand and deny his Lord. He will curse and swear. He will do everything he can to separate himself from them. He will join in the jesting against Jesus. He will make jokes about his Savior. 
And when the rooster crows the second time and Peter looks up, it is not judgment that breaks his heart. It is looking into the eyes of a broken-hearted friend. And Peter goes out into the night and wishes he could die and finds himself on the ground weeping before God in the very same spot where Jesus wept in the Garden of Gethsemane only hours ago. Only by love is love awakened. The great yearning of our Father is to be with us. And the story of the prodigal son, while being a story about redemption, is also a story that through it all, what God is crying out for is us to love him back. It's not a heaven to win and a hell to shun. Heaven can start right now. Heaven can start right now here on this earth as we draw close to Jesus, as we divest ourselves of this world and we hear his voice and we follow him. Our walk with him can start now and go into eternity. So it really doesn't matter when the world ends. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you have been a faithful friend to us. Throughout your life, you've demonstrated that we are so incredibly important to you and that it's all about love and it's all about relationships. The very definition of love comes from our understanding of you and you are the only source of it in this entire universe. We thank you for being a faithful friend and I pray that I will return that and I pray that each person hearing my voice will approach you with new eyes and that we will see you as you really are and that we'll reach out to you and that we will surrender to you fully from a heart that admires you and loves you. We pray in your name, amen. Thanks, have a happy Sabbath.